Hey there, welcome back. It's Miss Jarnigan again and my Fortress of Science here in Seattle, Washington. And we're going to be finishing out Natural Selection Part 8, which is going to be Lessons 3.2 and 3.3. So, what you will need for this lesson. A pencil or pen, some lined or blank sheets of paper, an optional but encouraged, a family member or friend you can check in with, a copy of the right chair discussing mutations, a copy of preparing your final report to Dr. Young, and your key concepts. So we're diving into part two of lesson 3.2, Mutations in a Population, and we're going to be starting up with activity three. So we're going to be investigating mutant fur traits in the sim, and this population here is a starting population of Australopes who are going to be able to mutate and their environment will change to cold. So let's think for a moment. Which fur trait shown on this diagram would be non-adaptive to a cold environment and which fur traits would be adaptive? So let's start looking at adaptive and non-adaptive traits when the environment changes to cold. If I mark something as NA, that means that the trait was probably non-adaptive. And if I mark something as A, it means adaptive. So if the environment's turned into cold and we're thinking about the amount of fur that these Australopes have, if it's cold, traits that are going to be non-adaptive are ones where you have a low amount of fur. Like trait number one. Trait number one's the least amount of fur we see, and that would be non-adaptive to a cold environment. Trait number two, mm, kind of similar actually, because there's also a low fur amount. And I'd say the same for trait three. And we get to trait four kind of starting to enter adaptive land, but not too adaptive. So the first four, I would say non-adaptive. Starting around five, maybe a little adaptive and six would be a bit more, and so on. So my prediction is, if the environment changed to cold, these traits going from about five to 10 would probably be adaptive, and traits one through four would probably be non-adaptive. So mutations can cause new traits in a population, and we're gonna use the sim to model how mutations can affect the traits seen in a population. But, Write and discuss time. Are all traits that are introduced by mutations adaptive? Can non-adaptive traits be introduced into a population through mutation? And why do you think that? Go ahead and pause for a quick sec. If you have Amplify at home, please go to lesson 3.2, tab three, page two, and try these missions out on your own. We're here in the sim. I'm gonna change the environment to cold and I'm gonna to go to the Australopes and I'm gonna turn on mutations. And we're really just looking at fur like you saw in the diagram for four. So I'm gonna let this run for 50 generations and just observe what happens. So one thing I'm already noticing is it seems like the level two traits are shivering and dying, but we are seeing mutant traits pop up. If you ever see the little Australopes that have a red dot, again, that notes a mutation occurring. And we actually have a trait for fur three that already occurred by seven generations. So let's see, yep, the Australopes are shivering, but yeah, we're starting to see some trait three, twos. I think I saw a one a moment ago, there's a five. Okay, so we can tell at least that traits are changing in this population. So I'm gonna now look at the diagrams of what this could have appeared as at 50 generations, and we're actually going to back up and look at generation five as well. This histogram shows what the population could have looked like after 50 generations and the environment had become cold and they can mutate. So pause a moment and write discuss which traits were adaptive 50 generations later in a cold environment. So we know that adaptive means that it helps you survive in your environment. So well, after 50 generations, any traits that we see still present is probably an adaptive trait. And the traits that I still see as present are, I was actually quite surprised by this, three and four 
did a lot better than I had assumed, as well as five, six, seven, and it's a little hard to see, but we also got traits eight and nine. Trait 10 did not appear. So based on that, we could say traits three through nine were adaptive to this cold environment. So now that we have a sense of what was adaptive far in the future, let's back up and think about what happened a little earlier in the timeline. So this histogram shows five generations. And it's, you can see that the traits had already changed pretty quickly within those five generations. So let's kind of think though, this histogram looks really different. Which traits are you seeing were probably non-adaptive to a cold environment? Go ahead, write pause. So when we're thinking about what could have been non-adaptive at generation five, let's use what we knew from generation 50. From generation 50, we saw traits three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine all appear in the population. What we didn't see exist was traits one and two. That would mean that traits one and two here definitely ended up being non-adaptive in the final population. So we can tell that because traits one and two didn't appear in the end, they definitely were non-adaptive, but it's interesting that they were there in the first place. And we know when we see a new trait happening, like traits one and three here, it must have been a mutation. With all of that in mind, are all traits that are introduced by a mutation adaptive? Okay. Can non-adaptive traits be introduced to a population through mutations? Okay, a couple key concepts for you. First, mutations are changes to genes that can lead to changes to the protein molecules, which can result in changes to traits. And second, mutations to genes can sometimes introduce new traits into a population. And I'm gonna back up and explain just a bit here because in my experience, this is one of the most misunderstood parts of natural selection. Like people think you get a mutation, it's always like this huge, like big change in things. And that's not really how it goes. So the most important mutations are the ones that happen at birth. And this happens all the time, regardless of environment. Usually though, the mutation either doesn't change the trait or it only changes it in an itty teeny tiny way that you can't notice. But because mutations stack up over generations, rarely you'll get a mutation that actually does significantly change the protein and will change the traits that you see. And this is what's causing new traits in a population. So if we go back to thinking about the whole DNA to protein to trait thing, this is an example of, let's say that's the DNA for color trait two, the protein it makes, and the trait we see in the end. And let's say this ostrilope reproduces and has a baby. And there's a mutation at birth, like it always happens. Well, this is one situation that's pretty common. You had a mutation, but the protein literally didn't change and neither did the trait. Yeah, a little not dramatic, but it's common. Let's say this ostrilope reproduces, has a baby, and we get mutations again. Well, another common situation is the protein did change, but in such a small way that the trait either didn't change or the change is so tiny you can't even notice it. Now, for the one that people think that happens all the time, but it's only occasionally, we have reproduction happen, we get a mutation, and bam, like huge change to the protein enough that the trait you end up seeing is different from before, at least somewhat different. So this is a situation where the mutation is giving a new trait. So long and short, we have mutations happening all the time, but usually the change is teeny, teeny, tiny. But because mutations can stack up many generations later, you can get a mutated protein and a mutated trait but if you notice, and I did this intentionally, that mutated trait is only a little bit different from what the parent had usually.
So just bearing repeating, key concept. Mutations are changes to genes that can change the protein molecules that can result in the change to trait. And mutations to genes can sometimes introduce new traits to a population. Okay, so let's wrap up lesson 3.2 with a little bit of a true false game, and then we're gonna respond to everyone's favorite jelly bean, Mr. Sherman. So spend a moment, press pause, and ask yourself, are these statements true or false? Okay, so mutations sometimes result in an adaptive trait. That's true, we saw that with the ostrilopes. Mutations sometimes result in a non-adaptive trait. Yeah, that's also true. Traits introduced by mutations will always become more common in a population. Nope. And then traits introduced by mutations will sometimes become more common in a population. Yeah, that's true. Okay, hope you did well on that. Now let's respond to Sherman. So, long-haired rabbit. <clears throat> It's really cold here. These rabbits must be glad they have long fur. This environment used to be warmer. It's gotten colder over many generations. And long ago, when it was warmer, there were no long-haired rabbits here. How is that possible? I thought adaptive traits had to be present in order for a population to adapt to its environment. Yes, we know that every so often, mutations can introduce a new trait into a population. Oh, I get it. The rabbits must have been cold, so they had an adaptive mutation for long hair so they would survive. Well, no, Sherman. Mutation doesn't work like that. Here's how it really works. So, Sherman actually is getting really close to a correct explanation here. But there's a little something he's missing. So go ahead, write, and discuss. Complete the sentence. Well, no, Sherman. Mutations does not work like that. Here's how it really works. OK. And also consider, if there had been a mutation that led to no fur for the rabbits, what would have happened to that rabbit? And finally, why did the mutation that resulted in a long-haired trait in those rabbits become more common in the population? Okay, this is it, the last lesson for natural selection, lesson 3.3, wrapping up the mystery. Let's spend a quick sec thinking back about the ostrilobes we saw earlier and what determines whether a new trait will become more common in a population. Pause a bit. Okay, well, actually, the answer to this is one of our key concepts. A new trait will only become more common in a population if it's adaptive. And let's break this down for a second. Mutations are random. The environment does not cause mutations at birth. The environment does not affect what mutations happen at birth. If a mutation causes a new trait, the organism's environment will determine if the new trait is adaptive or not. If the organism's environment changes, there's no guarantee that an adaptive trait will mutate. This is because mutations are random and not caused by the environment. And let's think it through with four ostrilopes with mutations. Two of them live in a color eight environment, two live in a color blue environment. And these two right here have the same color, they're both mutated for trait eight, and these two are both mutated for trait two. Well, all four of them mutated, but this yellow eight guy got lucky. Mutation matches a background and was adaptive. His friend, though, down here, if it was a blue environment, even though it's the same mutation, in this situation, it would not be adaptive. And same thinking about these little blue ostrilopes. <clears throat> if an ostrilope mutated for blue in this color eight environment, that would be unlucky and a non-adaptive mutation. But if that same mutation occurred with a color two environment, very lucky and it's an adaptive trait. So just one more time, a new trait will only become more common in a population if it is adaptive.
Okay, so before we write our final explanation about the newts, let's get in a little practice about discussing mutations. So what you're seeing over there is an Antarctic eel pout. And they're a type of fish that can be up to three feet long and look like eels. They can range in color from yellow to brown, and they're found in very cold water, such as a water near Antarctica. You'll be considering the Antarctic eel points at three different times to explain, did mutations affect what trait was most common at time three, and why that did or did not happen? So I'll demonstrate first. I'll show you how we're going to analyze the histograms, how to give claim, evidence, and reasoning for this argument. And just a reminder of trait labels. Plus S is more likely to survive, minus S is less likely to survive. Plus O is likely to have more offspring, minus O is likely to have fewer offspring. And we have a new trait label, M, trait introduced by mutation. For what I'm gonna demonstrate, this is my histogram of the Antarctic eels at time one when they lived in cold, warm water. And we're gonna start by thinking about what traits are adaptive for warm water and which ones are cold. And we're gonna consider the trait cold resistance. So I'm just gonna be labeling for the survival and offspring part. We can't really label any mutations at time one. And if I'm thinking about cold resistance in warm water, if the water's warm, my ability to resist the cold doesn't matter that much. So having a level two cold resistance, well, if it's in warm water, that's going to be helpful because you don't really need to resist the cold too much. So you'd be more likely to survive, more likely to have offspring. You'd say the same about trait three. It's a little bit low in cold resistance, which is fine, they're in warm water. So this would be more likely to survive and have offspring as long as the water stays warm. However, traits four and five, mm, I would say that's probably gonna be a little less likely you'll survive and have offspring because if you have a high cold resistance in warm water, you're probably gonna overheat. So now I'm gonna consider the population at time two. When land masses moved millions of years ago, the water became much colder. Time two represents some time after that environment change. So let's go ahead and look through this histogram, analyzing the traits we see. We're going to consider again, are the traits that are adaptive and non-adaptive, but for cold water this time. And we're gonna think, did a new trait mutate between time one and time two? So if the environment changed to being cold, that means cold resistance actually is becoming an adaptive trait. The water is freezing, your better ability to avoid freezing to death is gonna increase your survival. So these individuals with low cold resistance probably going to freeze to death. So the lowest one, trait one, I would be very certain these would not survive and they would not be likely to have offspring. Trait two is a little better than trait one, but I still would not expect survival, probably not a high enough cold resistance. Trait three is in the middle ground. I would expect that there's at least a possibility that these would survive and have offspring. In traits four and five, I am pretty confident. That's a good amount of cold resistance. You'll probably survive if the weather suddenly turned to cold or rather the water changed to cold. So now that we have an idea of like the likelihood of survival and offspring, let's consider was there a mutation? At time two, I'm seeing traits one, two, three, four, and five. At time one, I saw traits two, three, four, and five. That means the new trait, trait one, that had to have been a mutation. Okay, now considering the population at time three. Time three represents many, many generations after the environment changed to cold water. And we're still gonna consider, are the traits we're seeing adaptive to cold water or non-adaptive? And did a new trait mutate between time one to time three? So at time three, the environment is still colder water. 
And again, having a high cold resistance is adaptive to cold water, low cold resistance is non-adaptive. So tray two, yeah, we already said this, tray two is unlikely to survive and unlikely to have offspring. Tray three, yeah, there's at least a possibility of survival and offspring. And traits four and five, they actually are fairly adaptive to the cold water. Now the real question is, do we see a mutation between time one to time three, and that mutation survived? Well, in population three, I'm seeing traits two, three, four, and five. But when I look back at time one, traits two, three, four, and five, there was not a mutation seen in the population at time three. So what does this all mean? So did mutations affect which trait was most common at time three? Why or why not? In this situation, no, mutations did not affect which traits was most common at time three. The evidence is a mutation for cold resistance to trait one did happen in the population at time two, but this trait was non-adaptive. There are no individuals with trait one in pop at time three. And the reason is mutations to genes can sometimes introduce new traits into a population. New traits that are not adaptive, like cold resistance and cold water, will become less common over many generations. So now it's your turn. You're going to analyze the histograms, give your claim, evidence, and reasoning. So, write or discuss. At time one, the Antarctic eel pouts used to live in warmer water. What traits are adaptive? What traits are non-adaptive for warmer water? Awesome. Okay, at time two, the Antarctic eel pouts live in cold water. What traits are non are adaptive to cold water and non adaptive to cold water? Was there a mutation between the population at time one to time two? At time three, Antarctic eel pouts have been living in cold water for many generations. What traits are adaptive to cold water and non adaptive to cold water? Was there a mutation between the population at time one and the population at time three? Did mutations affect which trait was most common at time three, why or why not? And when you're done writing or discussing that one, really look back at your key concepts and be feeling really good about the reasoning that you have here. All right, so now we're all ready to finally answer the mystery of the newt. And how did a poison level trait that wasn't present in the new population become the most common trait? So, this is a histogram we'll be considering at four different time points. The population 200 generations ago, 50 generations ago, 40 generations ago, and the population today. The writer discuss, label the traits for the population 200 generations ago. Label the traits for the population 50 generations ago. Label the traits for the population 40 generations ago. And now label the traits for the population today. Okay, now here's the big part. Now that you have a fully annotated histogram, Explain how your model answers this question. How did a poison level trait that wasn't always present in the new population become the most common trait? So that's a wrap for natural selection. Next time, how do species change over time? And you'll find that out in evolutionary history part one. So from me, the kitty, and all of your teachers, we miss you. We know we're doing great and hope to see you again soon. So thank you and signing off from the Fortress of Science. No, kitty, no, no, okay, uh, she's done, she's done.